to the Colts. Olby Ryan Lee. With the uh, first pick of the draft, the Indianapolis Colts select quarterback, University of Tennessee, Peyton Manning. Another edition of the Climbing the Big Board podcast. I butchered that last time, man. I called it Climbing the Pocket podcast for whatever reason. I kind of get the two mixed up because, you know, we're doing so many podcasts around this time. But <laughs> right. Climbing climbing the Big Board podcast, episode three, is back. It's been a couple of weeks, but I'm joined by my co-host, Miles Gorham. Miles, how's everything going? Everything's going good, man. Uh, you know, diving into – all the college got you know all the college prospects right now, and obviously I was enjoying the the Viking season too. Definitely, and you know, there's a lot of things that's happened since the last time we've had an episode. Specifically, there's been a lot of shakeup in the SEC as far as coaches. You know, the biggest one right now has been Butch Jones. He just got let go at Tennessee, a move a lot of people seen coming, but we just didn't really know when. It was going to happen. Um, Bush Jones was let go a couple of days ago. Um, just a little background on him. He ended up going 34 and 27 in his time at Tennessee, but he just couldn't get it going the past few years. Um, they did have back-to-back nine-win seasons, but just three and nine in his past 12 SEC games. And we all know there's a lot of pressure in that conference. It's definitely considered to be the best conference in all of college football, but he just put really good recruiting classes together, but he just couldn't get the most out of them. So, Bush Jones has been let go at Tennessee. Just what's your thoughts on that, Miles? Yeah, I think it's a, a tough situation for them. Um, I'm kind of curious to see what, what direction they're looking to go now after Bush Jones because I know that, you know, the, the Tennessee teams, it's a, that, that school in, in itself is a good, um, a good spot for a lot of coaches, I think. So, I, I'm really curious to see what they do because uh, I'm sure they don't want to, you know, completely start over. But this is kind of what they're choosing to do if they're deciding to, you know, after they let go of Butch Jones. So it's always a, uh, it's always tough to go through those transition periods because you know, it's always hard for those new coaches coming in because you know they, have, you know, they try to give themselves a, a couple of years to, to get settled in, get their recruiting classes going, and you know, sometimes those coaches don't even make it after, out of the, you know, the two years or whatever. Right, so right. I think I think it'll be tough for the whatever new coach comes in because expectations are always going to be high no matter what season they're in. So yeah. and um, it's a, a tough one. You raise a great point. We all know Tennessee has a lot of prestige. They've had a, a lot of good football players and alumni from that school. So it really be, it really would be interesting to see what direction they go in. And, you know, during this time, there's one name that always services for every single job in the country. And that's John Gruden. For whatever reason, I'm not sure what it is. We all know he's a good coach, Super Bowl winning coach. But I mean, you're making seven to eight million dollars a year in the booth at ESPN. Why would you come out the booth for a college job? I just never <laughs> understood that. All that extra work, all the extra nights, like, yeah, I don't, I, I don't get it either. And it's not like he's getting any younger. And there's no pressure in the booth. Right. There's plenty of job security. We know ESPN has made cuts recently, but they wouldn't ever get rid of John Gruden, in my opinion, just because he's so well respected in the industry and by fans of his work. Yeah. Are there any other names you think, you know, for Tennessee that that intrigue you though? Uh I know the hot name for them, his name is escaping me right now, but he's the defensive coordinator of the New York Jets. Um he's actually a Tennessee alone. Um, another name was Jim Bob Cooter, the OC of the Detroit Lions. He has some type of Tennessee connection as well. So those were the two names that I'm hearing. Um, I really don't see either one of those two guys getting it just because I think they want a guy with more of a college background. But, I mean, I don't know, man. With those SEC jobs, you really never know who's going to get it. Right. Moving on to another SEC school who just let their coach go as well, and Jim McElwain, which is Florida. A very, very intriguing job. We know Urban Meyer did tremendous things there with, you know, the whole Tim Tebow situation and, you know, the glory days of Percy Harvin as well. So 
Florida, I think, is a very intriguing job simply because it's in a great state. It's in a football state. You know you're going to be able to get recruits there. And an interesting name has popped up, and I think it makes a lot of sense, and that's Chip Kelly. We all know his story of Oregon and how successful he was there. Um, had a brief stint in the NFL with the 49ers and the Philadelphia Eagles. It ultimately ended up not working out for him there. And he's kind of just been laying low in the weeds since then. He's been doing some work for ESPN, you know, as far as a commentator and helping out with those guys there. So he's kind of been laying low in the weeds and been waiting for that right job to come upon him. And I think Florida is a really good situation for him. We all know his offense is uh, was ahead of his time and, you know, he's considered an offensive mastermind. And just imagine those Florida athletes in his offensive system. I think it can be a really good match in the SEC if he can adjust. What's your thoughts on that? I agree completely. I mean, look at look at the athletes he's able to get up to Oregon. I can only imagine the, the type of athletes he's going to be able to bring to Florida. You know, he's just in a hotbed right down there. So um, if he can, you know, compete with the Florida State and, and Miami down there and and bringing some of those top-notch Florida recruits back to you know to the University of Florida, that's it's going to go a long way because that's his you know his style of offense is you know like you said new age and always been it was always ahead of its time, you know. And if he can kind of help continue to spread out the the SEC defenses and stuff, and you know kind of turn that turn that conference around for them, I think that could be huge. And I think so. And we all know with the new head coaching hire always brings excitement. And I think Chip Kelly can really bring that excitement back to the Florida program that they really haven't had since the days of Urban Meyer. And we all know they want an offensive guy in Florida just because speed, that's their forte down there in the state of Florida. And Chip Kelly's offense definitely caters to speed. So I think his offensive system and his personality is really a good fit at Florida. Yes, he's going to have to hire the right people simply because he hasn't worked at a school in the SEC before as a head coach. He's been at Oregon, and we all know he's had success there. So not only will it be an interesting hire for Florida, but I think he can have success there. Transitioning on, which is a perfect segue, to another Florida school, the U. Miami seems to be back. We all talk about the prestige that Miami has, you know, the glory days of the U, and we all know successful alumni that they've had in their previous past. So they put it on Notre Dame last week, man. They ended up coming out with the win 41-8, to which was shocking to some people, but a lot of other people kind of expected it simply because the U was back, you know, the turnover chain and, you know, just the excitement that Mark Rick has brought back. It seems like he's revived that program just – what was your thoughts on that game, and did the score kind of shock you, or did you expect them to dominate Notre Dame like they did? Yeah, I mean, on, to be honest with you, I think both Notre Dame and Miami this year are, are both two teams that have, like, really surprised me in terms of how well they've played. So I didn't um, – going into the game, I was, you know, I was surprised by their overall records and thought, you know, maybe both both had a chance to, to go to the playoffs. And the way Miami handled Notre Dame, I was like, <laughs> that <laughs> – that definitely do, did throw me for a loop because I. Yeah. It didn't surprise me that Miami won. It just surprised me about how much they won by. They like yeah. completely dominated every phase of the game. They they basically made made Notre Dame look terrible. And Notre Dame's not a bad team at all. They're really good this year. No. So yes, they are. Um, that's that's what that's what threw me the most is how Miami was able to just control the, the entire game, you know, from start to finish. Yeah, and, you know, just piggybacking off of that, what really surprised me the most was how Miami dominated in the trenches. We all talked about how strong Notre Dame's offensive line has yep. been this season. And Miami's defensive line just completely overwhelmed them from start to finish. And considering how young Miami is in the trenches, it's really surprising to see them overpower and dominate, you know, the Notre Dame offensive line, especially considering that they have guys like Quentin Nelson and, you know, Mike McGlinchey up on that front who are going to be consensus All-Americans this season. So just to see how they dominated Miami or they dominated Notre Dame in the trenches was very surprising. And I'm with you. I didn't expect the game to be that lopsided. I figured Miami would win, but I didn't think it would be as convincing as they did. And the U is back, man. As a Florida State fan, it pains me to say that. <laughs> But they look really good right now. And I think the college football playoff 
rankings just came out, and I think Miami was I think number two. Third. Or the third. Okay. Oh, no, no, no. You're right. I think Oklahoma was three. Yeah, Oklahoma was three. And we'll get into that a little bit later in the show and get our thoughts about that as well. But transitioning on to another game, a team that was number one last week in Georgia. A lot of people were saying Kirby Smart is doing a really good job of building something special down there. And Nick Saban, disciple, transitioned on to Georgia. And it seems like Saban gave him the blueprint on what it takes to be successful in the SEC. And, you know, up until this point, they looked really good, undefeated. They were 8-0, I believe it was, or 9-0, one of those. And they went to Auburn and got completely dominated, ended up losing 40-17 to to Auburn, which was very shocking to me, considering how great Georgia looked to this point. Just what was your thoughts on that game, and did you expect it to be as lopsided as it was? Yeah, that, that's another one where I think there's just so many teams this year to me that are just – they're a lot more surprising how good they they are and how good they've been this season than, than you would expect. They're, you know, Ohio State's been up and down. Um, Alabama hasn't always looked all that great this season. But you have teams like Georgia and Auburn and Miami and Notre Dame. Most teams, you know, they're coming out of nowhere. They're, you know, they're big prestige, you know, big time schools, but they haven't really been performing up to standards as of late. But, you know, this year everything seems to start start to click for a lot of those teams. So I thought, you know, Georgia being, I think it will, I think it was nine and zero, or I'm, but I'm not 100 percent sure on that. It was either eight and zero or nine and zero. And um, you know, going to this game, you're like, if they can, if they can find a way to beat Auburn. You know they 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 might be able to cruise into the um, SEC championship or at least have a chance at it. Um, so yeah, it was. Um, I think their offense in general and Georgia the way they run the ball, it really surprised me that they weren't able to kind of establish a little bit more of that and and dominate in that in that sense because that's how they that's how they've been winning their games. They have you know probably one of the best best dynamic duos in, at running back. Um, so I, I'm kind of surprised by that, definitely by the score. Um, I thought they, I thought they were gonna be able to beat Auburn this, this, this week, this last week. Yeah, and I'm completely with you. I respect Kirby Smart a lot, and you know I'm a huge fan of what he's building down there. But they just looked a step behind in that game on both sides of the ball. Their defense is extremely fast. Um, they get to the ball extremely well. But you know, Kerryon Johnson, Auburn's running back, did a tremendous job. Jared Stidham, the quarterback for Auburn, played really well as well. So. It was really surprising to see Auburn's offense completely change the game like they did against Georgia's defense, considering how fast they have looked this season. And they've really overwhelmed the teams that they have played this season with their speed. So it was really surprising to see how Auburn's offense was just completely able to control the game. Yeah, Stidham, like you said, he's he's an interesting prospect, and he will be an interesting prospect, you know, heading heading into the offseason and everything too, so. Um, That's an interesting name. That's a a good name to keep an eye on to head down the road. Yeah, I definitely agree. I don't think he'll declare this year, but I think next year, I think it's going to be really be his year. Yep. Moving on to our last game of the week that we're going to highlight, Oklahoma and TCU. The Baker Mayfield train is, (laughs) is in full effect right now. Seems to be the Heisman front runner for everybody. And this was a big test for him because Everyone says that the Big 12 defenses aren't any good, and that's what he's really been facing to this point. So, And he's been lighting it up, and the Oklahoma offense has been lighting it up as well. But TCU came into this game with the sixth best defense in the country, so everybody wanted to see how Baker Mayfield and that Oklahoma offense would answer or how they would do against this TCU defense. And I think they passed the test with flying colors. So what was just your thoughts on how Oklahoma performed against TCU? Yeah, Oklahoma is one of those teams. I think how they lost. I mean, I know, I know, Iowa State's a pretty solid team this year, but I'm not how this team lost to Iowa State because they're they're far and away the best team in the Big Twelve. They're pretty pretty destined to be in the playoffs this year because they're they're such an exciting team and Baker Mayfield's playing at such a high level. I don't. I have a hard time not seeing this team in the playoffs. Um, but then you know especially the, the way they were able to beat TCU this last weekend. It's really good. Look, looks really good for Baker Mayfield in terms of the Heisman, Heisman race, which I know, you know, we'll, we'll touch on that a little later, but um, Oklahoma, they got a complete team. They're, um, they're finally starting to click on defense a little bit. 
I know they've had some issues at the back end uh, over the last couple of years where they're, you know, the corner, their corners are kind of susceptible. Um, so being able to shore up some of that this year has been, has been really key to that. And then um, obviously they're always, they're always an explosive offense. So um, them be able to do that on offense with Baker Mayfield is, is something special. And they're a team to, to definitely be, you know, uh, on the lookout for, for uh, winning the national championship this year. And, uh, being able to beat TCU this last week was a really big statement for them. I completely agree with that. Oklahoma looks really good right now, and that offense is very, very high power. And, you know, it's being spearheaded by ba- Baker Mayfield, who seems to be the Heisman front runner for a lot of people right now. And, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how they do the rest of the year, especially in the Big 12 championship game. Um, it's really unknown who they will play right now, but – if they can go undefeated all the way to the college football playoff, it'll be interesting to see how they match up against, you know, let's say Alabama or whoever they are to face in the college football playoff. And it's a perfect segue to our next topic, which is actually the college football playoff and our actual predictions. The college football playoff was just released or the rankings were just released. Alabama was number one. I believe Miami was two. Oklahoma was three. And who was four? I didn't get to see who was four. Um, uh, four. Escaping. I had this too. Give me one sec because I had it. Oklahoma was four. I believe it was. Oh, it was Oklahoma? Yeah. So actually, I had it wrong. Excuse me. So Alabama is one. Clemson. It's shockingly two. Miami is three, and Oklahoma is four. That's that's crazy to me. Yeah, which I'm, is I'm, really I'm, shocking. Yeah, I'm really surprised they got uh, Clemson up there right now. But yeah, I'm really surprised Clemson was up there, especially how they, you know, kind of sputtered against Florida State last week. It wasn't really a convincing win, like many thought it would be. But you know, Dave. They've rebounded since that loss to Syracuse early on in the, season, in the season. Their quarterback, Kelly Bryant, got hurt in that game. So everybody thought Clemson kind of got an unfair shake because it didn't seem like a real loss since their quarterback was missing. Um, they weren't able to overcome Syracuse in that game. So, But it's interesting. Clemson is a good team, man. I think they have a good team. The defense is really good. We all know the defensive line is really good. The quarterback is decent. But Davo Sweeney has established a culture down there, and we know they have championship breed coming off a national championship last year. So let's just say the season ended today. Who was your four teams in the college football playoffs? Oh, uh, <laughs> if it ended today, yeah. that's the, the tough part for me because I, I was really rooting for Penn State. Even even with the one loss, I thought you know they, they still an opportunity to to kind of work their way into it. But you know, obviously they lost this last weekend too, so um, they're obviously out of it. So for me right now, the my top four would probably be. I'm not even going to go in full order. I'm just going to pick the my four teams. I'd say Alabama, Oklahoma. Um, I think Wisconsin's got to be. Wisconsin right now has to be in the in the mix because they're an undefeated. Power five. five school, they're five. What's that? They're five. Yeah, yeah. I put. I'm. I'm putting them in over uh, Clemson right now. Yeah, I mean, Wisconsin seems to always and, be in and the Miami, mix. obviously too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely, we can't forget about Miami. If it was me, I probably would have Alabama one. Even though they struggled a little bit against Mississippi State last week, it came down to the last minutes of the game for them to pull that out. Uh, Miami, who had a convincing win, they would be two for me over Notre Dame. <clears throat> Three for me would probably be Clemson. And four has to be Oklahoma. I mean, they just look really good right now. And they're going to be really tough to beat. And outside of Alabama, I just don't think there's any one team that really looks dominant right now. We can say that about Miami, but – I still have some questions about Miami. I think the quarterback position might come back to haunt them down the road just because, I mean, they're young at quarterback, man. I really don't know how he's going to end up playing down the backstretch once we get to those actual playoff games. 
and the games really start getting tough once you're playing Alabama or a Clemson defense. But we'll see. It's going to be very interesting to see how that turns out. So how do you, how do you uh, not put Wisconsin in, though, if they're undefeated? I don't – I'm just not always a believer in Wisconsin for some reason. I mean, I, I respect I them. Right. I totally get it. It's just hard not to put up a school like Wisconsin in the Big Ten, in the Power Five, undefeated, not in the playoffs. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. I'm definitely with you. And I think they're deservingly so being put at five. And, I mean, they should be ahead of Clemson if they're being – if the committee right. is being completely honest about each team's resume. Wisconsin should definitely be in the top four over Clemson. I don't see how Clemson has a better case over them right now. But – it would be interesting to see how they come out and defend Clemson being two, especially over Miami and Oklahoma and over an undefeated Wisconsin team. Yeah, agree. But moving on, just a couple prospect injury news update. Probably the most polarizing prospect in this entire draft class, and that's Wyoming quarterback Josh Allen. Suffered an injury last week, a shoulder injury. That's been described as a sprained AC joint, supposed to be a game time decision this week. And we'll see how that goes. We all know shoulder injuries are tricky. And I mean, he definitely needs to play in every game that he can at this point. We all know that he's been highly debatable and highly questionable to this point, even though he's received a tremendous amount of hype. So, I mean, everyone knows the name at this point. Josh Allen is going to be probably the most highly debated prospect the closer we get to April. And it's going to be interesting to see exactly where he does end up getting drafted. Does he get drafted off his traits or does he get drafted off his performance? I, he, I hope it's not his performance for his sake. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we all know he's going in the first round. There's no yeah, denying more, that. more than likely, right? There's no denying that at all. Somebody is going to bet on his traits. And, I mean, deservedly so. He has tremendous traits. But when are we going to hold him accountable for his performances on the field? That's my and, biggest question about right. Josh Allen. And stop, and stop making the excuse about the talent around him, too. Right. I mean, do you really need Tanner Gentry and Brian Hill to be successful? Right. And like at that point, if you're that if you're that polarizing of a prospect at the quarterback position at that in that conference, you should probably be elevating the players around you. Not yeah. needing not needing them to be all world, you know, for you to be successful. So that's kind of where I struggle with it. I hundred and ten percent agree with that. Especially if you're a quarterback, you have the ball every single possession. You're the first person to touch it every single possession. So you're able to distribute the ball around to whoever you want to. I mean, yes, you can't throw and catch it, but I mean, completing nearly 50 to 55 percent of your passes is never good, in my opinion, especially, you know, a guy that's considered to be the best prospect since Cam Newton that some people have <laughs> said, which is, which is ridiculous to me. But yeah, it's crazy talk. It definitely crazy talk. But he's definitely going to be one of the most polarizing prospects of this draft, as I stated earlier. Moving on, you know, to offensive line, Connor Williams, the Texas offensive tackle, who coming into the season was a lot of people's top five prospect, um, suffered a knee injury against Maryland, I believe it was. He has a sprained ACL and MCL, as it was described, but he is supposed to be a game-time decision against West Virginia this week. Uh, head coach Tom Herman said that he is expected to play, but they still listed him as a game-time decision. And when he's on the field, he's a really good player. Every Or a lot of people were saying that he kind of looked different this year, not as good, especially in the first game against Maryland, but – it's a small sample size, and we've all learned from our previous mistakes and in the past that you can't grade or judge these prospects simply off of one game. So him getting a bigger sample size and playing the rest of this season will really help him tremendously, especially if he wants to be that first-round guy like a lot of people envision him being. Now, moving on to our next subject, 
the most illustrious trophy in all of college football, and that's the Heisman Trophy. A lot of candidates right now, but the one guy who seems to really be sticking out right now, and that's quarterback Baker Mayfield. I mean, just a tremendous talent. He's shown tremendous improvement and tremendous growth this season. Uh, there's other, you know, deserving candidates as well. Bryce Love, the running back from Stanford. Lamar Jackson, the quarterback from Louisville. And a sleeper pick that a lot of people have listed on their ballots to this point, and that's Arizona quarterback Khalil Tate. I know a lot of people don't really get to stay up and watch him, but he is very electrifying. So if you had to choose today, Miles, who would be your Heisman Trophy front runner? I think – I mean, if, if, you're, if you're basing it off of, like, you know, record and um, your team winning and everything like that, I think it's got to be Baker Mayfield. Um, I think he's probably my front runner. Um, I think Lamar Jackson still has to be ha – definitely has to be considered, though, because the numbers he's putting up are probably just as good as they were last year, but people kind of aren't as wild by it because it's the second time he's doing it, so they don't really, like, you know, think as much of it. But, you know, it's still, is, it's still an amazing feat what he's doing, like, on the ground and, and through the air. And I think people, you know, they look at him as like, – they consider him like a one-trick pony, but that's not what he is. Um, he's a really good pocket passer. He's able to do, you know, do things around and in the pocket and his pocket, um, movement is getting a lot better and is re he's been able to, starting to re be able to read the field and, um, move safeties and, and look up, you know, look off safeties and like that. So I think, um, for me, it'd be Baker Mayfield and then Lamar Jackson. And then, uh, that was probably my, my top two right now. And then, um, uh, Bryce Love's definitely up and up there. I think if Khalil Tate had better passing numbers and um, was a little bit better, you know, through the air, I think that conversation might be, you know, kind of similar to what Lamar Jackson had last year. But he doesn't he doesn't throw the ball the way uh, Lamar Jackson does. Yeah, and I'm in complete agreement with you. I think Baker Mayfield is clearly the front runner right now. What he's been able to do with that team and how he's been able to transcend them this season has been very very impressive and. I'm not sure if we've ever seen a quarterback rise as quickly in six months like Baker Mayfield has. A lot of people weren't really high on him over the summer. A lot of people were saying that, you know, he's just another air raid quarterback and just another product of the system. But he's made tremendous strides and improvements in a lot of areas that you want to see from an NFL quarterback prospect. And I wrote about this in my reading between the lines, you know, scouting journal last week make sure you go read that if you haven't already just his improvisation skills and I think he kind of undeservedly gets the Johnny Manziel label but they're completely different in my eyes because Johnny was more of a guy that just ran around and in hopes of finding guys that were open and I think the difference between the two is that Baker looks to throw the ball and try to win from within the pocket more than what Johnny did and I think that's what the biggest difference is between the two. And Baker, when he does escape the pocket and able to extend plays, he keeps his eyes down the field in search of finding guys open. So I think that's what the biggest difference is between the two. But that's just another subject for another day. On the subject of the Heisman, I think he is the clear front runner. If I had to pick a guy that was number two, I probably would go with Lamar Jackson. So I'm in agreement with you there as well. Don't let their record fool you. Their defense is really bad. So – I think that's why Louisville hasn't been very good this year. And, I mean, we talk about a support cast that isn't very good. We can say that about Louisville and Lamar Jackson. If you take him off that team, I think they're a three- to four-win team at best. So I think Lamar Jackson definitely probably is the second spot. Bryce Love is definitely probably the third spot. He missed the game against Oregon State. But, you know, he came back last week and rebounded very well. And Khalil Tate. I'm 100% in agreement with you with that as well. He doesn't really throw the ball overly well. He's more of a runner as opposed to a natural passer. So his passing numbers aren't really good, uh, but his rushing numbers are just through the roof. I think Pro Football Focus put up a stat where they said since week five, he has like over 1,250 rushing yards, which is just crazy numbers. Wow, that's like four, that's like four or five weeks. Man. Yeah. 
It's, it's just crazy. <laughs> news. I watched, I actually wow. stayed up and watched him. I think it was two weeks ago against USC, and they were down 21 points. And in the blink of an eye, they were able to come back just off his running legs. So it was really good to see just how special he really was. Not really a natural thrower right now, yeah. but he still has time to improve that. So, you know, moving on, probably your favorite segment of the show, game picks. You're just <laughs> you're killing me right now, man. You're killing me. <laughs> the game is up on me right now. Um, I mean, I'm sitting at – or you're sitting at four and two. I'm at two and four right now. I'm really hurting right now. So, I got to gain some ground on you, man. So, the first game we have for this week is Wisconsin and Michigan. Michigan is getting seven and a half points. Who you got? I'm going Wisconsin. I don't think Michigan's all that good. See, I try to be different so I can gain ground on you. But <laughs> this just is a game where I just can't go away from Wisconsin. I just think they're much better than Michigan right, right. now. So, like, in, but it wouldn't it wouldn't surprise me if Michigan won. That's the funny it, part. Yeah, it wouldn't. I'm completely with you, but I just can't put my eggs in the Michigan <laughs> basket. I, mean, I can't afford to go back one more game, so we're both in agreement with Wisconsin there. Next game is USC and UCLA. UCLA is getting 16 points. Who you got? Ooh. Oh, man. This is this is a big rivalry for them, too, so. Ah. Uh. You know, I'm going to go UCLA this week. It's not, it's not the consensus pick, but I think I just got I just got a feeling. See, I thought you were going to go USC here, and I felt really good <laughs> about Josh Rosen and my UCLA pick. So now I got to go with USC. <laughs> this game because I thought it was a toss-up, and this is the one game where I thought I could gain ground on you. So I'm going to go with USC. I'm going to put my faith in Sam Darnold to cover the 16 points that UCLA is getting. So, Miles says UCLA, I have USC. <laughs> Make sure you guys remember that if you're we tallying think so much up alike, at home. Man. Right. If you're tallying up at home, make sure you remember that. All right. Next game, the hometown team, Northwestern versus Minnesota. Minnesota is getting seven points. Who you got? Oh, man. Uh, you go ahead and go first on this one. I'll let you get this one. <laughs> I already assumed that you're going to pick Minnesota just because. Don't make me be the bad guy, you know. Just because you seem like a <laughs> P.J. Fleck guy. So <laughs> I'm going to go with Northwestern. All right. I'm cool with that because I can go with Minnesota and not feel bad. There we go. Good. So I got my two games difference to where I can make ground up on you. So if we tally it up next week and we're even, I'm going to feel really good. I got to gain some ground, though, man. I have to gain some ground. You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm telling you, the, the Gophers want to get bowl eligible, so uh, they got to win this one because they're not beating Wisconsin at the end of the season. So, Yeah, and you went to the game last week, huh? Yeah, yeah. I How'd that Nebraska, go? They whooped up on Nebraska pretty good. Um, Demery Croft, the Gophers uh, quarterback, he, he, he faked out uh, a safety out of his, his uh, cleats so bad on a read option run for, like, 70, a 73-yard touchdown run. Yeah. And, oh, man, he put this boy on skates. Yeah, and that's great. Um, they look they looked really good. And then there was uh, J.D. Spielman. Rick Spielman's son was on is on Nebraska's team. Mm-hmm. Um, he looked to be the only offensive spark that they had. Um, he looked pretty good, though. Yeah, J.D. is definitely a good player, very explosive. And yeah. We all know Rick Spielman was probably, you know, in the house for that. I'm sure he was there somewhere. <laughs> yeah, he's probably in the booth somewhere watching. Yeah, somewhere in TCF Bank Stadium. And how's the atmosphere there? It was, was pretty. It, pretty good? it was pretty good. It was a little, a little chilly, but um, it was a good atmosphere. A lot of, a lot of people showed up. There's a lot of, a lot of Nebraska fans though too. Oh wow! Um, they tra- I know they always seem to travel well though. I know because you know being in that area, they don't have really much else. Kind of like Iowa, they don't really have a pro team or anything like that. So um, I know they travel really well. Yeah, and I mean, a little chilly to you guys up there is like negative five degrees in Minnesota. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> so I'm sure it was pretty freezing out there. It actually wasn't that bad. We were just in the shade, though, so that, that never helps anything. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome, man. You know, PJ Fleck is doing a really good job, and, you know, we hope they get bowl eligible. But I need Northwestern to win this week. Come on, Northwestern. <laughs> I need y'all to win. I need y'all to beat Minnesota so I can catch ground on Miles in these game picks. But episode three, that's a wrap, man. You know, this is something we try to do every two weeks. We're going to pick it up to once a week once we get to, you know, around the combine and once these – all-star games pick up just so we can give you guys better insights and what we're thinking and what your team should do once the draft rolls around. But that's a wrap. Climbing the big board. Episode three is in the books. Thank you guys for listening. For Jordan Reed, Miles Gorman, thank y'all for listening. Oh, killing me. Miles Gorm. I always thank mess you. that up. <laughs> why do I say Gorman? I don't know why I say Gorman. You know what I it know. is? I watched that Elite 11 thing you told me to watch the other day, and they have a school name on there, Bishop, Bishop Gorman. Bishop, Bishop Gorman, yeah. Bishop Gorman. That's why I do that. <laughs> My apologies. That's all good. That's always funny. For Jordan Reed, Miles Gorm, we're out.